inflation is going. I think the the risk reward and the different scenarios ahead of us in market pricing in risk assets, so that can be equities or can be crypto, is actually right. pretty skewed on the downside. Why do I say that? If inflation would surprise further on the downside, let's say, so we would have a momentum of inflation slowing down. It really depends from the magnitude of this slowdown, but it it has been kind of priced in. So markets have been mm -hmm. very sanguine in pricing in a Fed pivot, although there won't be any Fed pivot near uh, anytime soon. Markets are forward looking and they're assuming, Paul, that if inflation keeps slowing down, the Fed won't hike anymore. They'll be happy right. with it. Now, I doubt already that this interpretation was the correct one, but this is what's been priced in pretty aggressively. Now, okay. imagine you move on the other side, as you correctly ask, then say inflation upticks, then none of that has been priced in all over again. So you would need to price a Fed that is extremely more aggressive because they told us that they will be data dependent. So if right. data don't actually work the way they want to see it down, and again, it has to do not only with the momentum, but also with how fast inflation goes down to 2% and where does it settle and what is the composition of the inflation basket? It's not as simple as looking at just one indicator. They told us that they want to see major progress from that perspective before they even think about taking the foot of the gas pedal. Now imagine if inflation starts to worsen again, they'll need to be ultra aggressive to make sure they put themselves in front of the curve and send a very strong mm -hmm. signal to markets. Real economic growth is gonna further slow down and pretty aggressively so much worse than people are currently pricing in and analysts are expecting. That's from a growth perspective, right? right. Then I have the inflation story. And on inflation, forward-leading indicators are pointing to some moderation of inflationary pressures. All right, that's okay. But then the market is already pricing those in, A, and B, they're pricing a, a reaction from the Federal Reserve that will be pretty lenient. It will be very loose and very easy, you know, accompanying yeah. this drawdown. And I don't, I don't really think that is the correct interpretation. So the balance of risks right now, given where mark, how markets have strongly reacted to this notion of Fed pivot that I think is misplaced, and given the fact that I expect also growth to deliver on the downside, I think that the risk reward is rather on being defensive than on being offensive when it comes to taking risks right now. The equity market delivered, and, and also risk assets in general, delivered major positive returns. If I would ask you now, Paul, what was the earning per share growth in S&P companies in 2019 year on year? And the answer would be, you know, what, 10% probably, because if the market delivered so well, growth must have been good. It was 0%. Earning per share in S&P 500 Black. companies in 2019 grew 0%. So the market delivered very major returns because of valuations. And the valuations were effectively boosted by a Federal Reserve, which was doing their utmost best to stimulate markets and stimulate the mm -hmm. economy. So what I need to see right now, if my base macro assumption is right, that the economy is going to roll over, is a Federal Reserve that is recognizing, Paul, that that is happening. It's recognizing that the downside in growth is hitting inflation as well. It's hitting the labor market harder than they want the labor market to be hit. And basically, they recognize they've done enough damage. Copper is basically the bellwether of global industrial yep. activity. It's used in anything we can imagine effectively. And so it tends to lead very well economic cycles and also asset returns. It's a very good cyclical growth indicator and it's been simply collapsing i mean you put up the mm -hmm. chart and you can see yeah. that well if you compare it to lumber lumber is even more cyclical Worse. because it's used yeah. in housing mostly but copper is broader as an indicator so i like to follow that a lot and it's been collapsing so it is a signal that economic growth is actually slowing down the job market is a coincident to slightly lagging indicator of economic of, of the status of the economic cycle and why because first the economy slows down credit becomes more expensive companies have to think about okay i have a business model where i i used to lever up a lot credit was very yep. cheap i could borrow at three four percent now i need to borrow at seven percent oh crap the business model doesn't work anymore so growth is slowing down already how do i handle this well, the first thing they do is they start investing less they cut discretionary spending they cut marketing they cut all of that but once they realize that it's not enough, so later in the cycle, they are forced to cut costs. And obviously they will look at their labor force as well. So yeah. the job market actually gets it slightly later in the cycle. And inflation is actually the most lagging indicator of all. The BLS, the normal non-farm payroll report, accounts multiple job holders are two, two jobs created. So if I have two jobs, then the non-farm payrolls will report two jobs being created. But in reality, it's me actually having to work two jobs to make sure I can make ends meet, right? And the household survey corrects for this distortion.
there are many other nuances that actually point out to the fact that the job market is doing okay, but this mm -hmm. is starting to weaken as well. Yeah. So I expect going over the next 90 days to start to see some disappointment as well into non-farm payroll, the more classical measure everybody's looking at. And uh, it is just part of the cycle. The world overall, because you said this is a global show. So let's talk about the world. In the world, there is something like over $200 trillion of private debt. So everybody talks about government debt to GDP. I look much more at private debt to GDP. And why? Because while the government can just issue the currency, I can't, you can't, and our audience can't. If we have a liability, we need to be able to service that liability with cash flows, with earnings, with salaries. Otherwise, it doesn't work. I cannot ask the bank to print some money to pay off my mortgage. <laughs> they won't do that, right? So private debt is much more prone to financial accidents, basically speaking. Now, right now, there is over $200 trillion equivalent of private debt in the G20 economies. Now, that's normally doable because real borrowing costs for the private sector have been very low. The economy was slowing down. Yes, but the Federal Reserve is going to perfectly accommodate that slowdown. It's going to be great, a fantastic soft landing. And that is what the Goldilocks uh, pricing means when it comes to markets and the economy, right? And I have to disagree with that because there are two lines that actually don't really square in this Goldilocks pricing. The first is, again, I don't think that tightening financial conditions so aggressively as we did with such an over-levered economy is going to lead to only a mild economic slowdown. The pieces of the puzzle actually don't, don't fit from a macro perspective there. Second, we have central banks that are not going to be lenient and nimble, and they're going to be you know, flexible. This is what we used to have over the last 12 years. But the last time we had drawdowns in labor markets or stock prices or risk assets, central banks could always step in and support markets. Paul, crypto and digital assets in general have this interesting uh, property of having some very idiosyncratic features, some very, like the ETH merge. For instance, the ETH merge is very little about macro and it's very idiosyncratic to the mm -hmm. space. It's a digital yeah. asset feature, right? So the crypto space is it has a relatively large market cap and it has these drivers that are very idiosyncratic to the asset class itself. So sometimes it can generate some interesting um, returns that are not correlated to, to assets in general, right? Now, back to today, though, I have to warrant caution. And why do I say that is what the Federal Reserve and the ECB and other central banks are trying to do is to make the cost of owning fiat currency a bit less bad than it was over the last five to seven years. Crypto has everything else as cycles. It's an asset class you can consider for the long term in your portfolio because it has a lot of features and we can discuss about that. But cyclically speaking, I think in this environment, it will tend to behave like a risk asset which is priced in dollars or in euros or in any other currency. 